Happy New Year. Celebrated last night, but not too hard, and you're ready for this morning. Looks like you made it. That's good. I don't know. I'm not going to ask how many made it to midnight. That's okay. That's, that's fair. If you didn't make it, I get it. That's understandable. Don't worry about it. Uh, it it's still going to come whether you make it to midnight or not, right? It's going to happen, so that's the way it works. Let me uh, start us off with a word of prayer, and we'll get into our worship service this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we can gather, and we want to celebrate all the goodness that you have done in our lives, what you continue to do, and what you have in store for us. We, Father, we want to follow your will, your plan, your purposes in our lives, and be the people of God you've called us to be, and be the body of Christ you want us to be. Help us to use this time as a, a way just to kind of be refocused on all that you've said and done and what you desire to do in our lives. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Chelsea? All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I think there's no other place to be the start of the year than church worshiping the Lord. Amen? All right. Why don't we stand? We'll be in with worship.
Well, good morning. This being the first Sunday of the month and the first Sunday of the year, we're going to uh, start off with the Lord's Supper this morning and observing that uh, ordinance. So I want to read a scripture text to you, and then we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll share the elements and share that time we have together. This is in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. It says, And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. But I say to you, I shall never again eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine at the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he has been betrayed. Joe, would you lead us in a prayer for the elements, please, sir? I'm sorry. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for who you are and what you did for us. As we renew ourselves and our spirits this, this new year, May we take these elements as a reminder of what you did for us. Mm. Renew our spirits, renew our charge for going ahead and reaching this lost world for you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And as we just read in the text, Jesus took the bread and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Remember that as often as you drink it, this do in remembrance of me. All right. Chelsea? All right. Will you stand as we continue for worship?
Good morning once again. Thank you for joining us this morning. If, whether you're here in person or at home watching on the live stream, hope you are so far having a happy new year, a few hours into it anyway. But um, and hopefully this new year brings brings you some prosperity and, and uh, just good tidings and everything. So um, if you're a first time visitor with us in the pew in front of you, you'll find a, a tan colored card or connection card. You can fill out the information on the front. For everybody on the back side, there's a spot for prayer requests, praises, um, whatever you feel led to to put down there and need prayer for. <clears throat> As we get ready to do the offering plates, if you have it filled out at that point, you can drop it in there. Or if it's not done by that point, you can leave it on the pew or drop it in the plate on the way outside this morning. So if you'll bow with me. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this time that we're able to come and worship you. And we started off with singing hymns up to you and celebrating the communion and what that represents, dear Lord. And now as we go into this time of collection of the offering, you just your hand be upon them and the furtherment of your kingdom and be with Mike as he gives the, the sermon and the words that you've given him to preach to us, dear Lord. And just your guiding hand be upon the rest of the service in your precious son's name. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome today. We're going to be starting for the next few weeks, uh, maybe, maybe more than a few weeks. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews. Just thought it would be a, a place to kind of start and look at some things. It's not a book that I often preach out or hear a lot about, uh, obviously, over the years. It's uh, one of those books that is towards the end of the New Testament. I would give you the page number in my Bible, but that will not help you. But it's back there. It's uh, right in between the epistles of Paul and then you start to get into the epistles from Peter. Uh, that's because they really don't know for sure. There's a lot of scholarly debate as to who wrote it. Uh, and so we, and that's not really to me the issue. I think the message of it is clear and powerful. And we're going to focus in the first chapter today, which is kind of kicks off pretty much what the entire book is trying to focus on. He's trying, whoever the writer is, he's trying to encourage and equip the believers in Christ who happen to be Jewish, who are living all scattered through the Roman Empire, and remind them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the one promised in the Scriptures, and he will kind of walk through that again and again in this text that we'll see over in the next several weeks. So if you have your copy of God's Word, turn to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to just read that together this morning. If you're able to stand with me, would you stand in honor of reading God's Word this morning? Hebrews 1, the entire chapter. And the author writes, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made purification of sins, he sat down, he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, and as he inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels to the, of the angels, he says, who makes the angels 
his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But the son of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will become like a garment, an old garment. Like a mantle, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will also be changed, but you are the same. And your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the words that we look at today and we are grateful that we have them shared and recorded for us. And I pray, Father, that you use me as your vessel to faithfully communicate what you have for us, your people today to hear, to apply, and to obey as we seek to start this new year off, Father, in a way where we are more focused upon who you are and what you desire to do in and through our lives. Bless this time and use it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Before I get into the message, just kind of as a side note, it is the first day of the year, and there'll be a reminder, we'll be, if you'd like to join us, we've been kind of trying to read through the Bible chronologically for the past several years. That link should be available on the website. Uh, if, If not, it'll be there soon. Uh, we use the U version of the Bible, and we just kind of read through it chronologically. A little different than reading, you know, the books as they are laid out for us. As, in case you weren't aware of it, the Bible is not necessarily laid out in a chronological format. So we're going to kind of read through that. If you'd like to join us, feel free just to log on. You can do that, and that app will do a great job of keeping track of your progress. And feel free to make comments on what you uh, read in here. I usually put one in there. Sometimes I'm the only one that puts one in, but that's okay. It'd be good to hear from the rest of you, but feel free to join us in that wonderful journey. If you have never read through the entire Bible in your lifetime, I would encourage you to to take advantage of this opportunity. It is an incredible experience to read through the book, through God's Word completely, and and kind of see the different things that God says and what happens and the way it all kind of all works out. It's really one story with a lot of different sub-dramas, I guess, in it, whatever you want to call it, some sub-stories, but it's a beautiful way to go through the text. But anyway, that's just a a sidebar of what's going on. Today, as we look at Hebrews and as, as we're beginning this text, there's so many things that we could think about, but really the, the author focuses as he's writing these words to these early Jewish believers on who Jesus is. And he's trying to help them understand, as I believe help us understand, Jesus is not merely a prophet. Jesus was not just a good guy. Jesus truly is the Son of God. Now there's some debate among various uh, faiths and belief systems as to whether Jesus actually said he was God or God's Son. And if, I, if you can't find that and see that in the Scripture, I don't know how to help you. I'm sorry. It's there in multiple areas where it testifies that Jesus himself says he is God's Son. One of the ways he does that, I don't know if you may have heard this in the Scripture, Jesus often refers to himself as the Son of Man. Okay? That's very significant. I am not the Son of Man. I'm a Son of Man, I guess, in the sense that I'm, you know, I have a Father, right? That's kind of the way it works. But when Jesus uses that title in that setting... That is referring to himself as the Messiah, as the literal Son of God. And they understood that, those who heard it. That's why they got upset when he used that terminology about himself. And there's a whole other bunch of areas we could get into, we won't get into this morning. But this writer does a fantastic job, obviously, of laying out for us who Jesus is and helping us understand that connection between the Father and the Son and the triune God that we worship, the Trinity, which we won't talk about a lot this morning to explain because... It's the first day of the, of the year, and we don't want to mess our heads up too bad, right? So we'll kind of just focus on the truth and the reality that is laid out here, and hopefully God will use this to speak to you and draw you closer to him and a clear understanding of who he is. And he starts out very much in the early part of the text here in the very first section uh, when he says in verse, you know, he talks about how he spoke about these things long ago in many portions, in many ways. And then in verse 2, he really gets into who he is. He says in verse 2, he says... In these last days, now think about it, this was written almost 2,000 years ago, and he's referring to it as the last days. So if that, they thought of it as the last days then, I would say that we definitely are, should have that same mindset today, that we are approaching the end of, the t- end of time. We never know when the last days will be. We never know when Jesus will return, but we need to be ready regardless of when that happens, right? We need to prepare our hearts, and he's, re- he's reminding them of that in these last days, It's been spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed the heir. Jesus is the heir of all things 
through whom he also through whom also he made the world. He's talking about Jesus. And this kind of refers back to John 1 in some ways. Jesus is God. He is the creator. That's kind of, when you think about that for a moment, well, he's the son, he's the father. How does this all work? I really can't explain it very well, and nobody can. Because this is something divine. This is an e- eternal divine mystery of the, the Godhead and how that all functions and how they are three distinct beings, and yet they are one. That's pretty clear in Scripture. That's what it describes. But how that all, you know, I don't know if anybody else likes to analyze stuff and figure it out. Anybody else besides me? Okay, just me. Well, Joe, okay, just a, just a couple of us. It kind of messes with us when we can't just set it down and, you know, you like the outline and you like it in the format and this is, okay, I got it. Well, you will meditate, think about it, and try and ascertain and understand what that really means, what the Trinity, how it functions, and you will never figure it out because it's not meant to be figured out. It's more than that. It's, it's a mystery. There's elements, and we use all kinds of, uh, kind of images to help us kind of understand, but all of those images fall short of who God truly is. And he's wanting them to understand, as he wants us to understand, I believe, that he is God. He is the one that made the world, that spoke the world into existence, and everything that we know, not just the world, but the universe, everything that is. And in verse 3, he says, He is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things in the world by his power. Understand, he is describing Jesus as having the glory, the power, and the very substance of the Father. He is God. And he made, when he had made, and, and I love this, this last part of that verse when he says, and when he had made purification of his sins, he then, after he had done the job he came to do, to give us deliverance, to give us salvations, to make the way between us and God right to be that sacrifice for our sins. After he had accomplished that, then he sat down to reign on high. He had accomplished all that he came to do. As, as, he, as he says on the cross, it is finished. He has done it. And because of that, it helps us understand that he has a much better place than the angels. He is much higher than the angels. Now, there is a cult in our world that believes and professes that Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. Yeah. That exist. There's always somebody that has a crazy idea. I won't say who, but you can research it. But they believe that, and they say that because they believe Jesus is a created being. But the scriptures are very clear. He is not created. He always is. I don't even want to say has been because that would mean that he would pass away. He just is always. And as he is the eternal creator, the eternal God, and reigns with him, he obviously has a position above even the angels. And, of course, he then goes on to say this. Now, which of the angels did he say? You're my son. Did did God ever say that in Scripture? Does he say that to the angels? You're my son. Today I've begotten you. No. He describes only one that way. He also talks about being a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And when he again brings his firstborn to the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Now, how many of you remember just a few, last week we were talking about Christmas, right? You remember what one of the most beautiful pictures of the Christmas narrative is? Is the shepherds are out in the field, right? They're hanging out with their sheep. It's dark. I mean, it's country dark. I mean, it's really dark out there. And then what happens? You remember? A host of angels appear before him, and one of the angels says to them, guess what? He's here, okay? And they are overwhelmed by this experience. They are incredibly in awe of it. But what is the purpose of the angels? What are they doing in that? They are worshiping God. They are announcing the birth of his son, they are there to worship because they understand who he is. There is not a, they are not the same. They were created by God. Jesus is is eternal. He is uncreated. He has always been, always will be. He just is. And he goes on to remind us of that. And he says, let all the angels of God worship him. He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. And he's talking about that this is the difference between Jesus and the angels. Now, as, I, as many of you know, I have never seen an angel. Maybe you have. I've never experienced that in my life. I know some people have. But always when you read in the scripture and somebody encounters an angel, how do they usually respond? They go up and give them a high five, right? They respond usually in fear and terror, don't they? Because this is something they're not used to seeing. They're overwhelmed. And yet those angels in all their might, all their power, and all their glory serve in submission to the Almighty and to Jesus himself. 
They are, mission, they are messengers. They are servants of the Most High. And they are there to exalt him. And that is who they are. And he's wanting us to understand they're different. They're not the same. They are different. One is created. One has always been. And that's who Jesus is. And he goes on then, and he then talks about the Son in the next verse. I know we're kind of flying through this. But I'd encourage you to take some time to read back through some of the things that, that we're looking at this morning and just read through this text. because there's, there's more here than I have time to get into this morning. I, I just don't have time. If you wanted me to really walk through it the way I'd love to, you better make plans to stay here and have lunch. That's all I'm saying. But I don't want to do that to you this morning. It's, it's New Year's. Many of you are still just trying to stay awake. I get that. You may have stayed up a little too late last night trying to welcome in the new year. But I hope our hearts and minds are focused on this great truth and reality because he reminds us of who he is and he reminds us that his throne will be forever. He says in the second part of verse 8 there, his righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Why? Because he has loved righteousness, hated lawlessness. Therefore, your God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your commit. commit ah, I can't even talk this morning. Your companions. And then he describes him in a way in these next few verses that I hope really helps us understand who Jesus is. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. Pretty much what John says in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and all things that came into being came through Him. He is the Creator. The one we read about in Genesis 1 is Jesus is present. He is there. He, is, he has created power. He is a creator. Now, like I said, I don't understand how that all works together. I, I just don't quite grasp it. But it is testified here quite clearly that that is who he is. He is not just like an afterthought. This was never one of like God's backup plan when Adam and Eve blew it in the garden. He said, oh, well, i got to figure out a way to redeem humanity. Let's, let's see if we can do this. No, this plan was always in place in the heart of God and the mind of God because God knows all things. He knows how things are going to work out. And he says he has this plan and this purpose, and Jesus is always the plan, our salvation, our deliverance. And the writer reminds us that not only was he at the beginning and the heavens are the work of his hands, he created all things, but that those things will go away. Now, it's hard for us to grasp the idea when we look out into this world and we look up into the stars at night that that stuff will one day disappear, isn't it? That's hard to fathom when you think about it. I mean, it's been there longer than we've been there. Would that be fair to say? Now, I know some of you think you've been around for a while. But no one's been around as long as what we look into the sky and see. They've been around for a lot longer than any of us have been. If things on this earth have been around a lot longer than we've been here. And those things will one day go away. They will vanish. They will pass away. And God will remain. He is eternal. He will not diminish. He will not disappear. He will not, you know, just kind of fade away. He always is. And that's one of those things that is really hard for me to wrap my mind around. I think about my life, and I think about, especially as I've gotten older, I think about the way things used to be. Anybody ever go there? There were things I used to be able to do that it's not wise for me to try now. Can anybody, men, can you relate to that? I've been told that the greatest dilemma of men who are older is forgetting that they are men who are older. That's one of our struggles, right, guys? We forget that sometimes, and we say, well, I've always done this. I can still do it. And then, you know, sometimes we realize, and, 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 the, and, the, and life and the body has a way of teaching us, that's what I think the purpose of pain is, that no, you can't do that anymore. Slow down, stop. You know, this is one of, my, one of the struggles my dad always had up until, even until, until his health deteriorated where he couldn't do anything. I mean, I've told the story of my father. One of the ways he tore his rotator cuff was out bucking hay with his grandson in the barn and thinking he could out throw the hay. He was in his 70s, by the way, but he thought, you know, his teenage grandson, Aaron, who's a, who's a big guy, who could just throw that stuff up like it was a rag doll, my dad thought, well, I should be able to do that too. Well, maybe when my dad was in his 40s and 50s, he could do that, but not in his 70s. And he didn't understand that. And his doctor tried to remind him. And he, it was the, the conversation as my mother, because my father would never tell me that. What, you know, I mean, because that's just not the way it is. He, would remind, he was reminded by his doctors the same. He says, George, at our age, there's only one thing we ought to be swinging, and it ain't hay bales. It's a golf club. You should swing nothing else. 
And he kind of chastised him for the behavior. But that's one of those struggles that we have as we realize as we age, things change. But God does not change. Though my body may deteriorate, though my mind may not be as sharp as it was, was, there's a lot of things about me that change. God does not change. Jesus does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the Almighty. He is the Eternal One. And that's what is rolled out. And I love the, the imagery here. I just want to kind of walk through what he says here. Not only laid out the foundation of the earth and the heavens about what they will be, but I like this. And they will become old. He talks about the heavens and, and creation. It will become old like a garment. Anybody ever had an old garment that just kind of wasn't what it used to be? Now, I'm sure none of you keep those clothes you had when you were young, right, that you'll never fit into again. Now, I, I, I had my last church, I had a gentleman, I don't know how this guy pulled it off, but he could actually, in his 70s, still wear his Air Force uniform that he wore in his 20s. There is nothing that I've ever had in my 20s that I could wear today. I'll just be honest with you. It shrunk. No, it didn't. <laughs> That's what I like to say. My wife used to accuse me when something would happen and, you know, and I'd look at clothes on the, did you, not, did you dry this too much? It doesn't fit anymore. Well, that's not the clothes fault, buddy. That's yours. She didn't say that, but I think it was implied. And, but for some reason, this gentleman was able to not do that. He was able to stay the, the same health. It was amazing that he was able to take it. But most of us, that doesn't work that way, does it? Things change. Things that we once were able to wear, we can't wear anymore. So it's kind of like that garment you keep and it just sits there and after time it'll kind of just not be what it used to be. And what he's describing, the world and creation is like that. It's like an old garment. And what, what Jesus will be able to do is he'll just kind of like he'll roll it up like an old garment and get rid of it. But he is the same. He is unchanged. He is the same as when creation began, and he will be when everything we know comes to an end, the end of all things. He is the same. He is untouched by time. He is eternal. This is the one that we worship. Jesus is so much more than what we really fully understand sometimes and that what some even proclaim. He is God. He is the eternal one. And we looked at this I believe a few weeks ago when we looked at John's gospel in John 1, and he's just reminding us here and laying it out for us, the writer is, that this is who he is, that everything <coughs> changes, everything goes away, but you are the same. And the last part, your, ear, your years will not come to an end. Now, I know that one day on this earth, in this life, my years will come to an end. As sure as I stand here today, the day will come when I will no longer breathe and this body will Stop. Everything that worked that I, I treasure so much, the ability for the heart to beat, to breathe, and all those kind of things, that will come to an end one day. And I'm not trying to be morbid this morning, but that's a reality. We know that happens. We see that happen in the lives of all those who have come before us and have already passed. We know that will happen to us one day. But Jesus will live on forever, he's trying to say. The Son does not, is not affected by that. And the power and the beauty and the glory of that is something that's hard for us to fully grasp in a lot of ways. And this great truth that's hard for us to grasp is kind of like some of the things that we see in this world that just kind of overwhelm us. I mean, there's some things you look at and you can't really say much because if you say something when you're looking at it, it just kind of cheapens the moment. Maybe if you were privileged to be around when your first child was born. That's just one of those moments that's just like, I mean, what do you say? What words, words cheapen that. It's, it's an incredible experience. It's an incredible miracle that God does again and again and again in our world. It's an amazing thing, and yet we're, we're just in awe of that. For some, maybe it's when you're looking out in nature and you see something that you haven't seen in a while or seen before, or looking at the skies, or maybe you've been privileged to go places. If you the first, How many you remember the first time you saw the ocean? You remember that? As I'm making, most of you in this room were this close to it. I imagine you've probably been there at least once, I hope. If not, you need to get out there at least to say you've seen it. I mean, you know, when you're a Midlander like me who had to wait till he was in his 30s to see it, 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 was, a, it was an experience. It was overwhelming just to see that. I mean, I'd, I'd, seen, I'd seen video and movies with it, you know, and kind of had an idea. I knew it was there. But to actually stand on the shore and see it was, it was overwhelming. 
I can't imagine. I haven't done it yet. It's on my, on my, I guess for lack of a better term, bucket list. One day I hope to see the Grand Canyon. I'm sure that's one of those things that those of you that have seen it, that just kind of takes your breath away. There are things like that in creation. But even more so than that, what God has done, what God has accomplished through Jesus Christ should leave us completely, totally, and utterly in awe. What he has done for us, that the God of heaven would leave that heaven, come to earth, have a relationship with us, make a way for us to have that relationship with him so that we could know him and experience who he is, overwhelms me every day. Why would God care about somebody like me? But he does. And that's what the writer, I believe, is trying to lay out for these pe- believers to understand that this is the, the Almighty, this is your Creator, this is the one that loves you, and He is beyond what you can understand, and yet He wants to know you intimately. He wants to engage you, He wants you to experience Him and understand as best you can who He is, and to begin to grasp that love for Him and to trust Him and to walk with Him on the journey that He has for you. And what better day to really fathom and think about that the new year's day right this is the day when everybody makes the resolutions right that they'll keep for maybe a week there's all kinds of fun memes out there about gym membership you know that's one of the things fit that's one of the first that's one of those uh resolutions that we often make that we're going to get healthier right we're going to exercise more we're going to eat less and eat the right things and whatever and that's good that's a good resolution to have hard to keep right Because chocolate just tastes good, for those of us that like chocolate, and certain pies just attract us, and this time of year is probably not the best time of year, right, because we're still, you got the sweets left over that you've had that are still there, right, that stuff, and you know, you don't want to waste it, right? I'm with that. I get that. I understand. I'm with you on that. But there's some dangers there, and it's, it's not that you can't have it, it's just that you can't have it all in that moment, right? It's usually not the first piece of pie that is the problem. It's the third or fourth, right? Right, guys? Come on. Anybody? Yeah, I know a few of you get that. Some of you, some of you are like, oh, you know. And then there's those who are young that can eat like the whole pie and nothing doesn't bother them. That's, that's not me anymore and that's not most of us anymore, right, if we're honest. One of those things that changes with age is the ability to eat whatever we want and not worry about it. And then as we get older, we know that if, you know, you, I'm, I'm one of those, I look at that and go, how far do I have to run to cancel that out? Or to, that's, what I, that's what I think in my mind. But those changes, as I said earlier, don't impact God. And those, those resolutions that we make while they are wonderful and good, what we have to understand in our hearts is it's an opportunity, really, today is an opportunity to start anew. It's a new year, brand new day. And what better day to say, okay, God, I really want to focus upon you. Help me to follow you in the way that I could and see what God might do in and through your life in the years ahead, in the days ahead, throughout 2023. That 2023 might truly be a different year for you in your walk with Christ. I think it's an excellent opportunity for all of us, but it's also a struggle. Because I don't know how you are, but I know how I am. I have habits. Anybody else have habits? I have routines. I have the way I do certain things, the way I, you know, that I approach certain things. And it's almost like something, almost like I go on autopilot in certain things. You know, I just, certain things happen and I'm going to respond this way. Now, I'm sure no one else does that. But over time, I've been around long enough that that just seems to be the way it works. And what I have to allow the Holy Spirit to do in my life is to help me understand there are some times that I don't need to respond the way I've always responded. Instead, I need to trust God and let God work the change in me that he has already begun. And let him do that in your life. And that's what this newness is about. It's like in another text that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when he says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When we become a follower of Christ, we are brand new. It's almost like we're a baby, in a sense. We are radically changed. We are a new creation. It's not, he doesn't just fix us up and, you know, and, and make us up and wash us up. He changes us and gives us a brand new start. And today, on a day like this, when a lot of people are thinking about a brand new start, you have the opportunity, you and I have that opportunity, to trust God anew, to allow Him to be who he says he is, and to allow him to move and work and walk in our lives the way he desires. 
Because this God that we worship is worthy of everything that we can give Him and more. He is worthy of our absolute surrender and our trust in Him. Because He has accomplished all things, He will endure as always, and He will accomplish His will in and through our lives no matter what we try to do. And I always think it's better that if we submit and surrender to His purposes that we become willing agents and vessels to be used by Him. Doesn't that make sense? Rather than being rebellious and saying, Lo, I'm not going to let it happen unless it happens the way I want it to. But as we think about this text and some of the things, as I said, and like I said, I feel like I've only just kind of zipped through and skipped through this text, which is about all I can do in this allotted time. I just want to walk back to that last verse, last couple of verses, when he reminds us of who Jesus is. When he says what the Father says to him, he says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Those enemies that stood against Christ, that stand against the Son of God, that stand against God's purposes, they will eventually one day be overrun. They will be overwhelmed and they will be like a footstool to be trampled on, to be stood upon, to be used in that they will not succeed. And I know we live in a world where at times it looks like the enemy is winning. And in some ways, he is. In the hearts and lives of some people, Satan has, is having his way. But it will not last. Because God always wins. He always accomplishes his purposes. Sometimes it doesn't work out the way we think it should. It doesn't work out the way we would like, but it will work out his way eventually. And what he reminds us of here is that the enemies of, of God, the enemies of Christ, will one day be a footstool for his feet. He will overwhelm them. And of course, the image there, it doesn't, I don't think it literally means he's going to turn them into an ottoman. I don't think that's what he's talking about here. But what I do believe it means is that he will be over them. They will bow to him. They will realize he is who he is. The scriptures are very clear that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone will. Even those who have most, been most antagonistic towards the truth of God's word and the reality of who he is will one day not stand but kneel before him in reverence and awe. They will surrender. They will realize he is who he says. Now, the choice that we have now is that we can do that now as opposed to being forced to do it. Now, I don't know how it was for you growing up. Did you ever have to do a forced apology to one of your siblings? Anybody have siblings? You know, when... Now, I'm sure it didn't happen in anybody else's house, but in my house with me and my two sisters, it did happen more than once. Where they did things that just made me mad. I, I can't explain it. And I just reacted in a way that I shouldn't. I'm sure that doesn't happen to anybody else. And uh, as the older brother did some things I should have done, tormented them, you know, to try and get a little bit of revenge, you know, whatever. That's what siblings do. I'm sure that's, my house was not the only house where that happens. But... Then I can remember that time when my parents found out and then my, my dad and my mother would make me apologize for what I did. Now in my heart, I knew they deserved what I did. Right? From my perspective, now I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just saying that's what I'm thinking in that moment. And I'm sure that a lot of us struggle with that. We, we think, okay, yeah, that's, no. I, but I would say the words, I'm sorry. And it was really hard to say and, 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 of course, I had to say that about ten times because my mother said, say, you didn't mean that, did you? <laughs> That's not the point, is it, when you're like 10 or 11 years old? What do you care? No, I, of course I didn't mean it, but you told me to say it, so I said it. Well, say it like you mean it, was my mom would say. So I'd, I'd put on my best acting gig. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> right? Been there? Right? I'm sorry. I didn't even try to muster up a, almost what looked like I was going to cry. Because I tried, you know, I tried very young to be an actor. I'm in family, not in real, you know, but I tried that. I would put it on and, and she would say, again, no, you're, you're faking it. Of course I'm faking it. That's the truth, right? I'm, yes, I'm not sorry. But as I think back about that, that way a lot, that's the way a lot of people will have to bow the knee. 
and their rebellion and their stubbornness and all that they've wanted to, to throw their fist at God, to curse God, they've rejected God, but the day will come when the knee will bow. Everybody. You think of the most vile or vicious opponent of God that you've heard speak, and there's all kinds of them on the internet that like to talk. I, atheists on the internet are hilarious. They're just so dumb. Anyway, that's a story. That's a sidebar. They say things out of the top of their head, and they just, you know, and then, no, never me. I'm, I'm my own man, my own. I know I'll never, you know, this isn't, you know, whatever. You're going to bow the knee. You're going to bow the knee. It's so much better to do that now than to be forced to do it, isn't it? And what the writer is trying to help us understand is who this Jesus is. He's giving us a much bigger picture than we often think about on Jesus a lot of times in, in our world. If you were to ask most people who Jesus is in the world, they're going to say, well, he was a good teacher. He was a nice guy. He did some miracles. You know, he taught us about God, whatever. They're going to say things like that. And those things have a portion of truth in them, but they're not. He is God's son and God himself. He is the one and only if you have seen him, you have seen the Father, is what Jesus says. I don't know how it gets any clearer than that, that he understood who he was. You know, I would never say that, that if you've seen me, you've seen God. No, you haven't. You've seen much less than that. I'm sorry, if you've seen me, you've seen a mess. But anyway, that's about all I can say. But Jesus could say that because it's true and it's who he is. And this writer understands that and wants us to understand it. And as we embark on a new year and looking at all the opportunities that we have, may God refresh our spirits and remind our hearts of who Jesus truly is. And this Savior that has come into our lives, that has changed us and continues to work in and through us through the presence of the Holy Spirit, is so much more than we could even imagine. And what we learn as we grow and walk with Him is more and more God unfolds to us His identity, His purpose, His plan, and what He can teach us and who He is. It'd be great if when I first came to Christ, I got it all figured out that first day, right? That'd be great. But that doesn't work, does it? We know that. We can't, we can't fit it all in here. It doesn't quite work. But as time goes on, as we follow him, we learn more and more about who he is, right? That's why when you read the word of God, you can read the same text over and over again and see something you never saw before because the Holy Spirit reveals something to you that, wasn't, that was there all along, but for some reason we missed it. So how about you? You think of a better day than today than to say, okay, God, I'm going to, I, I know we say this a lot, but God, I'm going to truly seek to follow you in the way that you are worthy of. As he describes here, I'm, gonna, I under, I'm beginning, I want you to help me understand and un, unpack this of who you truly are. I mean, I've just shared some basic truths from this writing here and from the scriptures of who Jesus is. But what really... The burden of it lies upon all of us to unpack that and what that is as the Holy Spirit begins to help us understand that and how we apply that to our lives. Because knowing the truth is one thing, but applying it is something more, isn't it? And there's a lot of things you know, but until you apply them, it's like you don't really know them. I believe God has so much in store for each of us in the years, year ahead that if he were to show us what his plans were for, what, you know, this is what it's going to be like in November and December of this year for you, what I'm going to do in your life, it would probably scare us. But as we walk that path with him, we can begin to let him help us see what he wants to do in and through our lives and begin to move us on that journey to where we can begin to grow and walk in him in a way that we never dreamed possible. Brothers and sisters, it, it starts really in, in a lot of ways with two important disciplines of what it means to follow Christ that will help us. They're really simple. And we all talk about, I need to do this more. Well, don't call it a resolution because, you know, resolutions are made to be broken, aren't they? But a commitment that maybe this, this is the year I'm going to spend time in God's Word and I'm going to spend time in prayer with my Heavenly Father. Those two disciplines will do more for your walk with Him than anything else. 
Five minutes with God is better than a million sermons with Mike. I'm going to tell you that right now. Not even close. You don't even want to think about that. I haven't even preached a million sermons in my life. I can't imagine what that'd be really, that'd be rough. But five minutes with him changes everything. If you haven't disciplined yourself to that, what would it look like if you said, okay, every day, five minutes. Five minutes. And see what God does. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this time. I just pray, Lord God, that this would be, as always, an opportunity for change in our hearts and lives. But, Father, that we would embrace it, submit to it, and allow you to work in and through our lives in a way, Father, maybe that we've talked about and thought about but haven't allowed you to do. I thank you for those that are here with us, those that have joined us on the live stream as well. And I pray, Father, that 2023 is an amazing year for each of my brothers and sisters and their families. A year of blessings, a year of encouragement, a year of victories. But I'm not naive I'm not enough to know that there are challenges that lay ahead of us as well. Difficulties and struggles. It's a part of life. But what is so amazing to me, Father, is that you're willing to walk with us in the middle of all that. And that's really what being a follower is all about, isn't it? Is trusting you on the journey. Bless and use this time in whatever way you desire. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.